welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I chat with Alex Glukowski, CEO at Matter Labs and co-creator of ZK Sync. We chat about the history and evolution of the ZK Sync project, the upcoming ZK Sync 2.0, which includes a ZK EVM, an EVM-based programming model and composability architecture, as well as a new L2 scaling technique called ZK Porter. Now, before we start in, I want to let you know about the ZK Jobs Fair, which is happening on April 22nd. So this is an event that I'm actually running. It's part of the ZK session series. It's the third monthly event that I'm putting together. But unlike the previous events, this is not a conference. It really is a job fair, all online. So I've learned that many of the top projects and companies working in the ZK community are looking to hire talented people into their team. And at the same time, I've seen that the zero knowledge community keeps growing. There's more students or folks just coming out of school, as well as employees in other areas of blockchain tech or other traditional tech companies who are looking to get their feet wet in the ZK space. So I decided to put together a social event that brings these two groups together, and that is the ZK Jobs Fair. So this is happening, as mentioned, on April 22nd. It follows the third day of the ZK Proofs Workshop, which is a full-fledged conference put on by our friends at zkproof.org. You can expect the job fair to be a social gathering on an interactive online platform. I'm still deciding on which platform to use, but have in mind something like Gather.Town or Topia or Sophia or something in that direction. But whatever the choice, I'll be sure to throw in some fun games or activities to try out while you're there. So if you are looking for a new opportunity in the space, or you're just curious to meet some of the folks behind the projects you know and love, do apply to be whitelisted for this event. I've added the application form in the show notes, and I'll shortly be announcing the sponsoring projects who will be present at these events ready to meet you. On another note, I want to say a big thank you to this week's sponsor, Mina Protocol. Mina is the world's lightest blockchain. It's a L1 crypto protocol that replaces the traditional blockchain with a zero-knowledge proof, ensuring a super light and constant-sized chain that allows participants to quickly sync and verify the network. Mina's mainnet has just gone live, offering users a platform to build a private gateway between the real world and crypto. Mina also has an active demo in partnership with Teller.Finance for end-to-end data privacy, showing how you could use Mina to access your credit score and prove that you meet credit threshold requirements for on-chain services without ever disclosing your actual score. Very interesting use case right there. So if you're interested... Visit MinaProtocol.com to find out more how you can get involved and join the community. So thank you again, Mina Protocol. Now here is my conversation with Alex Glukowski all about ZK Sync. So today I'd like to welcome Alex, the co-founder of Matter Labs and one of the co-creators of ZK Sync, back to the show. Welcome back, Alex. Hi, Anna. Very excited to be here again. Yeah, so this is actually your third time, I think, on the Zero Knowledge podcast. And I feel like what's cool with Matter Labs and the work that you've been doing with your team, I feel like I was there kind of at the beginning of that journey. Like I've seen it now for th- maybe almost like two years, three years. How long have you have you been around? So we started building uh, ZK Sync, I think two and a half years ago. It was December. I'm trying to remember, like, were you were you doing like hackathon projects before that point? Uh, not really. My co-founder was involved in a number of hackathons. That's what it was. I was doing different things, but then we converged onto the same idea from different angles. Yeah. And actually, the first presentation of ZK Sync was on hackathon in Singapore. Exactly. This is this is what I'm remembering. I think I may have been like I was there, and I was a judge there, and True. this is why I feel like I really saw. ZK Sync's kind of history from the very beginning to now in a way that I maybe haven't seen all, like other projects develop so much. So anyway, it's a project that's dear to my heart anyway. So I also, you know, as the Zero Knowledge Validator, we actually have started to do a few small investments and we have done an investment into ZK Sync as well. And so this is also an exciting thing. You're, you know, it's a, it's a very new endeavor for us and it's one of the first investments we've made. 
I'm very excited to talk to you today about this project and where it's at. So the first time you came on the show, I think we actually did a general overview of what a ZK rollup is. And the second time you came on the show, you introduced ZK Sync and Redshift. But this time around, like, what's kind of neat is since that second uh, interview, and since you've introduced ZK Sync, I feel like a lot of us have actually gotten a chance to properly interact with it because of its inclusion in Gitcoin. So the Gitcoin grant round CLR matching nine just ended, but like ZK Sync is, is something that people are probably more familiar with today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of this project and maybe how it's been going this past year now that like people can actually play with it? Sure. So we started working on this because it was uh, two and a half years ago. We just had crypto keys crisis and it was quite obvious that scalability is going to be a big problem into the future in the context of the mass adoption of crypto when we expect a lot of people to come and, and start using Ethereum and uh, crypto in general. And we kind of did not anticipate this to happen so fast and to such a great extent as mm -hmm. it, it turned out to be. So we realized that uh, zero knowledge proofs offer a tremendous potential to solve this problem. It was what the, the only way to break out of the blockchain dilemma to actually scale blockchains without giving up decentralization and security to, to the highest degree. So we started back then with basic R&D on ZK rollups because the technology, the, the fundamental research was not mature enough to support generic use cases. So like the zero knowledge proofs were still on the verge of being usable in production. Mm -hmm. Back then, we only had uh, the, the most uh, advanced proof system that was available to us was Crowd16. Uh, and that required a uh, trusted setup ceremony for each circuit. In other words, for each application and for each up update of this application, similar to how Zcash did this. And it was clear that's not very sustainable. And we did not have recursion, so we could only do some very simple applications, or some, some very, very limited applications in scope with fixed functionality. So we went for payments because we saw uh, the need for payments growing and people in a lot of countries embracing crypto as not only a store of value, but actually means of payment already back then. Mm -hmm. And this is what brought us to the first version of ZK Sync, which we launched last summer, where we just had payments with a heavy focus on usability. We, we made a rollup, which was very convenient to use. You did not have to mm -hmm. pre-register before. You could just use your existing Ethereum addresses uh, you could transfer funds to any Ethereum address, uh, no matter whether it's it's a normal account or a smart contract or, you know, like we, we built a UX friendly wallet with a lot of nice things. And it, it kind of paid off. We got a lot of integrations recently, starting with Gitcoin. Uh, in the or in the first Gitcoin round, we did, I think, less than half of contributions were through ZK Sync. In the latest mm -hmm. round, which just ended, 82% uh, of all contributions were through ZK Sync. Yeah, I mean, I think the way they displayed it too is to say, like, if you use ZK Sync, you actually can, this is sort of your savings. And the savings are so dramatic now that it makes True. a lot of sense that these are like, it's, it's so funny because it's really the, it is the need that's pushing people into this. You know, like it's it's really solving a problem and not just like a cool, nice to have. I mean, the first time around, I was just like, yay, I get to use a ZK rollup. <laughs> but <laughs> but I also saved some money. But yeah, this time around, it's like, there's no question. This is true. Uh, and it's, it's very clear to everyone that the need is burning and not only for payments. It turned out that you need uh, to scale now all the smart contracts on Ethereum. And this was clear already a year ago. And mm -hmm. uh, coincidentally, a year ago, something happened in the zero knowledge proof research, which, which made it possible to accelerate dramatically the adoption of this technology. Namely, Plonk proof system was introduced and recursion was invented for Plonk. Yeah. Recursion is what allows us to build this generic smart contract functionality, which we're very excited to talk about today. We just published an update about ZK Sync development roadmap. And we will heavily rely on it to bring EVM compatible or EVM portable smart contracts to a ZK rollup. 
which is huge news. It, it's it's really yeah. hard to underestimate the importance of this. So let's let's talk about that kind of the the update and the things that are now planned. And then I want to revisit how Plonk and recursion actually allow for this. But first, why don't we introduce like what are these updates? What's coming up for ZK Sync? Um, so the main news is that we we are going to open a public testnet for ZK Sync 2.0 in May. And ZK Sync 2.0 is going to be the platform where we support smart contracts. And not just smart contracts, it's going to be EVM compatible smart contracts. You will be, it's not strictly EVM compatible in, in the strict scientific sense, because we will recompile your Solidity code into a different virtual machine, which is SNARK friendly, mm -hmm. but it's essentially reusing the same code. And this is what most people mean when they say EVM compatible. So you, you can take your existing Solidity code, your existing tooling, and make very very minimal modifications in, in this. And maybe for, for a lot of contracts, you won't need to do any modifications at all if you don't rely on some specifics of EVM. And it will just work out of box in the new version. And it will also be composable with other contracts. So the entire programming model remains exactly as it is now on Ethereum. You have your contracts. Those contracts can have some state. You can update the state. And the, they can call each other and have atomic composable transactions across a, a number of different contracts, exactly the same way you have now on Ethereum. Mm. And what is this called exactly? Like, is it still just called ZK Sync or is there like a term for this EVM compatible component? Technically, there is no name yet. We will, we will think of, of naming. Maybe we'll come up with something nice, but let's call it for now ZK EVM because that, that's going to okay. be easy for people to grasp. It's a virtual machine, which is Turing complete. The, this is something we've been working on for many months now, and it's coming to completion. And this virtual machine has a compiler from both Zinc, our, our existing smart contact language, which is based on Rust, and from Solidity. And we use LLVM to compile and use a lot of optimizations uh, and, and security features from LLVM. Mm. And we use recursion to efficient to make it efficient, because with zero knowledge proofs you can only create efficient circuits which are specialized. But then, if you have different different smart contracts and uh, they require different uh, types of operations to different degrees. So, for example, one contract call may have a lot of storage accesses. And a different smart contract call might require uh, a lot of uh, using of hashes. It would be really hard to fit them into a single type of circuit. That's why we're using different circuits for these different operations. And we combine them nicely uh, through the recursion. So you kind of do like another snark of those different snarks. And I guess, are you just doing one? Yes. You're just doing one level of recursion here. You're not doing like multiple recursions or... We're we're going to do multiple levels of recursion. Oh. So what we 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 already have recursion live in production okay. on mainnet for payments. This is why zk sync is currently the by far most affordable roll up for payments. We have the lowest cost across all roll ups. There are some Validium solutions with with lower costs, but they don't offer the same security guarantees as, mm -hmm. as roll ups. But across all rollups, we're cheapest because we use recursion. I see. I recently did an episode on languages with Alex Ozdemir. We actually surveyed all the ZK languages and Zinc was one of them. But do you feel like, are you moving a bit away from Zinc as your core language and focusing more on the solidity use? Or are you going to really be promoting both of those things? I think the short term solidity will be very exciting to, to most people because they can immediately port the existing applications. Got it. And this is why we are going to put Solidity in the foreground for now. Mm -hmm. But we are still continuing development of Zinc and Zinc will be available from, from the beginning, from, from the testnet in May. Uh, we think that long term, Rust-based languages will win. And we might even proceed from Zinc to, to native Rust at some point in the future, which, which yeah, is... Cool relatively easy for us because we use LLVM and we can use any language which compiles to LLVM with LLVM front end, such as C++ or Rust or, or Golang or Python or something like, like Haskell. Uh, but we think that Rust seems like the best candidate long-term for uh, smart contract-based development. 
uh, we see this with with other platforms embracing Rust, uh, such as uh, Alio and Polkadot, and Near, and uh, Facebook's uh, Deem, previously Libra. Uh, mm -hmm. So long term, I think Rust will win. But short term, of course, we want to support the existing ecosystem and let everyone migrate seamlessly on zk Sync, and this is why it's a good. Got it. But like, but even like on day one, when you can choose between using Zinc or Solidity, does Zinc offer some benefit? Like, is there something that makes the programming better, easier? Does it offer anything like, clo is it closer to the, Z the ZK proofs or something? Yeah, well, it, it offers exactly the same functionality. Just the language itself is better suited for building secure applications. You have okay. immutability out of box by default. You have a uh, pure functional programming style with no side effects and so on and so on. You, you have things like the, the syntax is a lot nicer. Uh, you just like produce, you need to, to write less code and this code is going to be more secure than if you approach it with something like Solidity, which is coming more from the direction of uh, imperative programming. But from the functional standpoint, it's going to offer the same scope of, uh, of capabilities. Got it. So I'm kind of curious, like there are some new solutions that are coming out also using Plonk, such as Aztec. I mean, they're kind of the developers of that concept. Um, their focus seems to be very much on privacy. And I'm wondering, like, how are they different? And does ZK Sync have the ability to also provide privacy? Or is this like a secondary, is this a secondary benefit that you're not as focused on? This is something we're not directly focused on because our main uh, concern is now scalability and com compatibility of the existing applications. Uh, but you can easily build privacy on top of ZK Sync because it's it's coming naturally out of box of the design which we're offering. Because we will have a an op code for recursive proof verification, and those proofs do not need to go on uh, Ethereum call data. Mm -hmm. And they are very cheap to verify. Like with, with as with all the rollups, the cost of call data by far overweights the computational cost of producing zero knowledge proofs. So if you want to build a uh, something like Tornado Cache or any other privacy preserving application on top of ZK Sync, you, you will be able to do it the same way you do it now on Ethereum, just a lot, a lot cheaper. Mm. Your transaction costs with like into, onto another cache, you will have to pay something like 100 times the cost of a normal L1 transaction, or maybe 20 times. On ZK Sync, it's going to be roughly as expensive as a normal ZK Sync transaction. So it's not coming in the base layer of the protocol, but as a like layer three, you can easily build anything there. Okay. In our last episode, we actually did talk about this idea of this roll-up existing on its own with validators and like having somewhat of its own ecosystem. And I know that in that conversation, we did have quite a bit of conversation about data availability. And I'm kind of curious here, what you've described with the Z, let's call it ZK EVM in ZK Sync, if actions are happening in there and they're not kind of reporting back to Ethereum, like is that then fully a standalone blockchain of its own with validators writing to a chain? Like are they acting as sort of the connector to the to the main chain, or are they actually doing something else in this case? Well, I think it's uh, similar to all other rollups. I think that it's fair to say that all rollups are standalone blockchains that are uh, rooted in Ethereum and that use Ethereum network to broadcast, to propagate and make data available. So in this sense, uh, yes, it's a separate chain with a separate state, but it, it completely relies on Ethereum for its security. So as with any ZK rollup, the protocol offers exactly the same security guarantees as layer one, as a main, because you can access the data, mm -hmm. but you have to go and, and fetch data from the archive nodes and download the transaction inputs and then reconstruct the state from there if you don't trust the validators. Like, do you have, in a way, your own consensus mechanism happening there anyway? Or, like, or, or are the validators doing something more passive than what we see in normal POS systems? So with ZK rollup and with rollup, rollups in general, you strictly do not require a consensus mechanism, but you can build one, yes. you can have one. 
if you okay. want. And this will provide. So this is interesting to me. Yeah. This is exactly the question I have because it seemed like I always understood ZK rollups as not needing the consensus mechanism. This is like true. that was the thing that the the L1 provided. But now I'm hearing something else. And this is what I want to explore a little bit. Like this sounds like an, like an evolution of thinking around these, these architectures. Well, there was this idea of uh, progressive decentralization that you should start with the minimum decentralization required for application and then proceed gradually because it, it will give you faster time to market. And this is exactly what we're doing. So we're starting with a single sequencer or single, single uh, validator and then we're going to introduce a decentralized consensus to avoid any potential for censorship and to, to have the system fully controlled and owned by the community and not by any single party. Mm. We don't want to be a single party that provides the proofs and like have all the responsibility and, and be subject to some political pressure. We want it to be owned by users. So this is coming for ZKC. Got it. And like right now, the ZK Sync that we've used on with Gitcoin, that is like currently there's a single validator yes. and it's you guys? This is true. Okay. I mean, I know that other constructions like Hermes, they also have a way to decentralize in a way that that connection point between the, the L2 and the L1. But how would you compare then to like, how does the validator community or consensus community of ZK Sync compare to something like Hermes? Well, in Hermes, uh, as far as I'm aware of their design, it's still a centralized sequencer, but then you can you can kind of decide on layer one who is going to be the centralized sequencer for the next epoch. But then throughout okay. the epoch, it's the same. What we mean with the consensus that we are building is that every block is decided upon by the consensus of uh, validators. So that you don't have not only you don't have a potential for denial of service by, by any single validator. So with, with in, in the Hermes design, if the validator who gets the next uh, slot, the right to produce blocks throughout the next epoch, just goes offline, then you lost that slot. Then the entire system will stop and wait for the next slot to arrive. But with the design that we're building, uh, if some of the validators are faulty, uh, it's going to be Byzantine consensus anyway. So like the, it, it will still continue. As long as you have the majority of the validators who are live and functional, you will just move on. And this is important. If we're talking about a network which secures operations for millions of users and handles thousands of transactions per second, you can't really afford a downtime of even uh, some minutes. Mm -hmm. Also, something we talked about in the last episode was about data availability on the main chain. Is that still the same setup that you have today with this kind of evolution or has that changed? Oh, this is a very, very exciting part, uh, which I'm really happy to talk about. We, we're, we're publishing the post. By the time the episode is live, we will have details about this new construct live. And indeed, for ZKSync 2.0, we will start with a architecture called ZK Porter. So with ZK Porter approach, the users will have an option to have their accounts on the ZK Rollup side or the ZK Porter side. And the ZK Rollup users will have all the benefits, all the upsides and downsides of ZK Rollups. So they, they will pay normal ZK Rollup transaction fees and they will enjoy the full security guarantees of L1. On the ZK Porter side, if you choose for that account type, you will have slightly degraded security guarantees, but they're still better than optimistic rollups, and we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will pay minuscule prices. This will not hit with Ethereum gas prices because the data availability is going to be stored off-chain, but mm. off-chain secured by a, a consensus of many validators broadly decentralized. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the both account types will remain fully transparent to each other and seamlessly interoperable. So for example, imagine that you will have a Uniswap on the ZK rollup account. So it's fully secured by uh, like, just like, like main one. And all the big lending partners will have their accounts also on the ZK rollup side. But then you will have millions of users on the Porter side who can interact with this Uniswap just the way they would interact with, with the, like normally with, with the Uniswap, just like make, making a simple click in MetaMask, and they will have to pay this very small transaction fees. So th this is what ZK Porter gives you. 
So the ZK rollup construct, so there's these two, it's almost like two versions and you can, you can opt in or you can choose which one you're going to do, but the ZK rollup, does it still have the data availability setup that we talked about in that last episode? And by the way, everyone should check that out potentially if they want to, I keep referring to it, but like there you had explained how it was written on to L1. Is that still the case for the ZK rollup version? Uh, exactly, yes. So for each update in the ZK rollup account, we will have to publish the final state of that account on uh, Ethereum network. So anybody can check that. And if something happens to the validators, you have full guarantees that you can retrieve this money. Uh, you can reconstruct your state and then provide the proof of ownership and, and fetch the, the funds from this account. Got it. And with the ZK Porter, though, it's off-chain consensus. And I guess like that consensus actually determines state and all of the data lives there. Well, it, it's, it's independent. So we'll have a separate consensus for the state, for, for the blocks that will go to mainnet or like for all our blocks in general. Uh, but this data consensus is only securing data. I see. Okay. And this is why the threshold of entry is going to be very low. You will be able to participate in this consensus with, uh, with a simple laptop. I mean, your participation will be meaningful. You, you will be making some money from providing this uh, data availability to the network. And we will be able to collect signatures from 10,000 validators for each block. And it doesn't have to be synchronous. Mm -hmm. We don't have to collect those signatures within three seconds. We can take, it can take time. We can, it can be 15 seconds, half a minute, because the blocks that go on mainnet are asynchronous anyway. We still have to wait for the zero knowledge proof to be generated, which is still some, a few minutes probably. So we can wait for all the signatures to be collected and we can set the threshold very high so we can have a quorum of a super majority of the staked token holders for every block to go on mainnet. It's important to know that all transactions concerning ZK Porter accounts are secured by the same zero knowledge proof state transition function that we use for ZK rollup. In other words, the validators can never steal funds and they can never corrupt the state. So the only bad thing that can happen to ZK Porter accounts is that the majority or super majority of the token holders will sign some valid state transition, but will withhold the data and not inform everybody about what this uh, new state is. Okay. In which case, uh, all the accounts in ZK Porter will be frozen. Uh -huh. including the stake of the token holders. So the, the only thing they can do is kind of like take everyone hostage together with their own money and, and freeze <laughs> and, and, and destroy their stake. So it will be suicidal. It stops. So we are talking about a, you know, for this system, in order to, to remain secure and the funds to remain accessible, we need a not a honest majority, not a honest minority, but a, just a rational minority. So we need a minority of people who are sane and don't want their funds to be lost mm -hmm. from the token holders. If you have that, it's, it's, it's going to be fine. But like when you mentioned Validium, and I know you're like, it's not like Validium, but it's a bit like Validium. Um, like in there, I know that there's a committee and here, I guess it's this validator group. And in both cases, there's this assumption that it would be suicidal to like, you'd have to wreck yourself for no reason and... Sure. Many people would have to do that at the same time in order for this to be corrupted. Is that sort of the link part, except that instead of it being a committee, it's more of a validator community? That's exactly the difference. And the, the yeah. problem with the committee is that you have a few validators there, uh, because if you have a lot of them, then how do you manage, how do you govern the participation for whom uh, are you supposed to wait? Like for all of them, for, for half of them, like it must be a small group of permission participants. And if it's a small group of permission participants, all they have at stake is their reputation, which can be a lot, but it's hard to quantify. But then they might have some 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 different in incentives, which you, like they might be subject to some political pressure. Imagine regulators coming to to this known group of small validators and telling them, "Now you have to introduce KYC and AML, and people on this list, we just want to confiscate their money." Mm and they will have to comply. They won't be able to confiscate the money immediately, but they can freeze those accounts and then do 
an update at some point and, and take this money. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is a very plausible situation. We know that this happens to, to exchanges. We know that this happens to a lot of centralized projects because they are known, they, they have a clear set of owners uh, and there are a few of them and it's really easy co- to come after them. Now with the decentralized data availability, we are in the same situation as with Ethereum. There are a lot of nodes, so it, it's really important to have this threshold low and to allow people to participate with minimum hardware requirements. And also the decentralization of the token is going to be very important because you want the super majority or even simple majority of the token holders to be as broad as possible, not to be controlled by 20 nodes, but maybe by 2,000 nodes. Mm. So in this case, it's going to be very hard to come after all of that. It's, it's, it's a truly decentralized system. And this fact is what makes the ZK Porter actually more secure than the optimistic roll-up. So this, this is a very interesting and nuanced comparison. And uh, some people might disagree with me, but I, let, let, me, let me explain the... Let's just examine how the security assumptions work in, in, in an optimistic roll-up and how they work in the ZK Porter. So with an optimistic rollup, there is uh, a broad notion that you need one of n honest participants for the rollup to be secure. So this is not the full story. The full story is that you rely on, on two different assumptions. One is that you have at least one honest validator who will catch the fraud and submit the fraud proof to Ethereum. And the second one is that this fraud proof will actually be mined on Ethereum by miners. Mm -hmm. You will be able to overcome any censorship attempts on layer one. So let's consider both parts separately. With one of an honest validator assumption, it will practically mean that you just need some small amount of nodes to be honest. Like you, you will require all the validators to be honest, but you will realistically have like not so many validators because the requirements of running an optimistic rollup node, which is running at full capacity and providing, I don't know, like 200 TPS on Ethereum will already be very high. Mm. Like you won't be able to participate in, and validate the optimistic rollup blocks with a simple laptop. You will actually need a, a well-secured, very powerful machine running somewhere in the cloud or on your premises with a lot of memory at least, because the uh, right now the Ethereum throughput is limited by the capacity of access on the database, because you have to do a lot of uh, random access reads in the database to reconstruct the Merkle proofs and uh, verify all storage accesses. And you will have to do the same thing. So like to, to accelerate this and be beyond the limits of Ethereum, you need at least a lot of memory. I mean, this to me is something I'm, I'm hopefully going to get to a chance to talk to a group who's building optimistic rollup soon so I can actually explore this even further there. But like, are they running just from your from your understanding, are they running like just a full Ethereum node and then having like an archival node or like are they running multiple nodes? I'm kind of confused as to why there would be such high requirements there. Like I always got the impression it was like ZK proof generation computation would be like the heavier thing. Than a fraud proof. Uh, the ZK generation computation it requires a lot of resources, but those resources can be uh, run in parallel. Whereas to run a sequencer doesn't matter for optimistic rollup or for ZK rollup. You have to run like what essentially is a normal Ethereum node. Okay. So you have to execute all the transactions sequentially, and if you go higher than the threshold, which is currently set for Ethereum, let's say 20 transactions per second, you go towards 200, 2000 transactions per second, uh, you need a fundamentally faster hardware to process those transactions. Got it. And the bottleneck there is storage access. (laughs) You just need like really fast storage. So essentially, probably you need to store all of the blockchain state in this case, optimistic rollup state, which is going to exceed the Ethereum state by far, since it's a scaling solution. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. We have to keep all of that, all these gigabytes of data, terabytes of data in memory, not on the on the SSD. And in the ZK rollup context, you're just 
writing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Like the validator is required to have a very high, very powerful hardware profile. Okay. But not the validators of ZK Porter. The validators of ZK Porter only need to store blocks of data. This is a lot easier. So the optimistic rollup require like memory requirements of a sequencer is comparable to the verifier of a ZK rollup as well. But the ZK Porter using the sort of Lydium one, I know it's not, but like in that direction, <laughs> would require a lot less. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. This is correct, yes. Would you say, though, then, like, with the optimistic rollup versus vanilla ZK rollup, is it actually the same amount of memory and computational power needed to run those nodes? So the sequencers are almost identical. Okay. Then on the ZK rollup side, we will need to to produce the proofs for the blocks that have been compiled, which have been produced by the sequencer. And this can be done in a completely untrusted cloud. Which, where you can provision in, like a lot of instances on demand. So anybody can do this. You just okay. need an account on, on, on different cloud providers. And eventually it's also going to be decentralized. But this for now, it's, 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 it's a solved problem. Just go, you create 100 nodes, they produce the proof, you collect the, them together, and then you submit this proof. Okay. But the sequencers are going to be of essentially the same way. But okay. to come back to, to the story, if your sequencer is, is highly expensive, like very, very powerful, has a lot of requirements, then only a few really motivated validators will run it. So you as a user just won't be able to, to run it. Mm -hmm. right? So like it will boil down essentially to just a number of validators running those nodes, and it's going to be a small number. And yeah, all of them will have to be uh, malicious to, to do anything wrong with, with the system or malicious or faulty. But yeah, with, with the ZK Porter, uh, it just the pure number is going to be much higher. Got it. Even though the assumption is not one of an honest, a minority, like less than super minority of rational validators. But then on the optimistic rollups comes the second part where you actually have to submit the, fr the fraud proof to Ethereum. And this is far from uh, solved. So right now we described an attack on optimistic rollups that will cost right like at, at the current price is something around 100 million US dollars nominal cost of this attack. And the actual attack is going to be a lot less. And we will publish a link to this in, in the in the comments to the show. Mm -hmm. And it cannot be mitigated as long as Ethereum remains on proof of work. Oh, yeah. So like the it's a threat which hangs on optimistic rollups. And the assumption is that it's a lot of money with a lot of uncertainty, so nobody will attempt this attack. Well, if you accept that argument, then uh, you're just much better off with the ZK Porter, where you know exactly how much money someone will have to burn. Mm. And, and th this stake might be up to like very, very high amounts, like 70% of all the stake uh, in this network. But then you will have like super low transaction costs. I kind of like you just hinted at the direction I want to take this interview next, which is, you know, currently ETH1 proof of work. There is, I mean, there's in the last week or so, there's been these, you know, proposals for actually how to move it to proof of stake. What does the ETH2 world look like with proof of stake and these ZK rollups? Like, have you, I, and I know it's been discussed quite a lot and people have, have given various perspectives and, and ideas of what this could look like, but I'm really curious what it looks like currently to you. Like, what does that future look like? What does even the transition look like? I don't think that a lot of things will change soon. So first of all, we'll have to wait for the merge to happen, which is realistically still significant time away because in Ethereum, you have a lot at stake and the, these things cannot move as fast as some new solutions. And once this happens, we will still have to wait for sharding to arrive, which is probably still some years away after uh, the transition to proof of stake. And before sharding arrives, essentially nothing will change. We'll have exactly the same system as we have now, just more uh, eco-friendly, right? Because we don't have to burn all this electricity. Uh, but from the point of view of protocol and data availability, nothing is going to change. Once sharding arrives, we have to see how exactly it's going to be implemented. 
and then potentially we'll have just higher capacity for uh, for rollups. Okay, but like a rollup wouldn't become a shard. They kind of are like shards, right? <laughs> they are like shards. They, yeah, they are I know. Like, they are exactly like shards today. Yes. Yeah, that's what's so interesting about yeah. that. And they show the the limitations of shards. So with uh, if you have multiple shards, they increase the overall capacity of the blockchain, but at the cost of making interoperability between different shards harder and less efficient and less mm. uh, convenient. And this is what we would have with rollups if we have multiple rollups on Ethereum. Well, not exactly rollups, maybe, but because they still share the same block capacity. But mm -hmm. if we had multiple L2 solutions, like multiple ZK porters, for example, then sending funds from one of them to the other will have to go through L1 mm -hmm. or through some complicated mechanisms with liquidity providers, which is going to be an impediment for... Uh, it's not going to be seamlessly composable. Yeah. So you will only have seamless composability within a single shard. And I think it will remain the same in if two, but we'll we have to see the final designs. Got it. Okay, but going back, let's go back a little bit to what you were saying about the fraud proofs on proof of work from Optimistic. If there is proof of stake, does that change a little bit, like the problem there? Like, does that make it easier, or maybe easier is the wrong word, but does it make it more? effective are they able to actually like i don't think it's roll back but are they able to actually like call the fraud proofs if it's proof of stake uh, they will be able to like uh, coordinate the community and say okay we know exactly who of the validators participated in this in this attack and mm -hmm. we're going to punish them uh, but this is also like you have to agree on these things beforehand it's really hard to change rules of the game once the game is on. Mm. And we see it with EAP 1559. So like, let's first get 1559 pushed through and then talk about some collective punishment for validators. Okay. Right, because like we see that there is a lot of contention and it's not that easy. We also see the situation with parity multisig where it was absolutely unambiguous. It was a mistake that costed a lot of people a lot of funds. And it would have been easy to make an upgrade, which solves the problem if the community really wanted to, to cooperate and was able to coordinate such things. But we did not see this happen, mm -hmm. right? So like the, it, potentially, theoretically, from the protocol perspective, what proof of stake gives you is the ability to coordinate, but the coordination still remains with the community and it, it's far from seeing this coordination like really actionable immediately. Mm. So I'm still skeptical there. And I'm also skeptical that such a coordination should take place. I'm, I'm very strongly against relying on human coordination for something that should have been built like more reliably in the incentive structure of your system. Like with Ethereum, miners are essentially free to do whatever they want, right? The, mm -hmm. From the protocol perspective, they can do whatever they want. They are not like they, they did not sign any contract with the with the society that we're going to do this and that. They just have some incentives to behave in a selfish way, which will benefit everyone. Yeah, because it's their it's in, in their own interest to include transactions and get the fees for those transactions, right? So you don't want to change that. You want to build systems that you, that are resilient from the underlying perspectives with like taking everyone's incentives into alignment. And I think we can build such systems. I think we can build something a lot more secure from censorship and front running using, of course, zero knowledge proofs. So we have uh, this, this interesting developments. We have these ideas uh, such as time locked encryption where you could encrypt your transaction and submit it to validators in an encrypted envelope so that the validators will include it in the block without knowing what the transaction actually contains. Mm. And this will only be revealed after the block is finalized and supported by the stake of validators. And I think this is a much better approach to, like, to solve both censorship and, and front running than to say like, oh, please guys don't do front running and don't do the, like, or don't do censorship and otherwise we're gonna punish you maybe somehow like with yeah. collective action. But is that is that something that you've actually built, what you just described there, is that something you've actually built into your kind of validator rules 
or or not? Like, is or is that just sort of an idea for for more of like an L one or an ETH two construction? Well, it, it's 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 an idea that we definitely want to build. So for now, we're focused on the basic uh, scalability, but we definitely want to have this built. And this but where requires does it live? Expertise. Like, which which part does that live in? What you just described does that it have has to, be... to remain at the consensus part of the protocol? So in our case, it will be at the consensus level of among the kissing validators and users. Eventually, a once will probably embrace this as well because it's just a great technology. It's it's the only way we can ensure that long term we don't have any censorship and any front running. So I want to like one topic I want to kind of touch on is the partnerships. So we mentioned Gitcoin. That's the one that I've actually used. But like what's coming up for ZK Sync in terms of projects that are potentially going to be working with it? Because, I mean, if you look at the list of investors that you recently brought on, there's a lot of DeFi projects there. And I'm curious, like, how far are you in talks with those folks? Are they just sort of like supporting? Are they potentially going to be using it? Like. Maybe share what you can on that front. Sure. So we, with all, all the partners who invested in ZK Sync, uh, actually are interested in using ZK Sync for their for scaling of their projects. Mm-hmm. We have three types of investors in this strategic round, which we just which we just had, and we by the way we only had strategic investors in this round. The first type is wallets who want to scale the the operations for the transfer swaps for their you know, massive user bases. So we are currently doing integration with uh, Argent, uh, Mikey, I am talking uh, with other wallets following. We, we have a number of new wallets who directly build on ZK Sync. And second category of projects is uh, exchanges and on the ramp of ramp of ramp platforms, where we want to integrate and allow transfers or like on ramp from fiat. And off-ramp to exchanges happen directly in the L2. Oh wow! Bypassing L1, <gasps> so that the users can can just like go purchase some some ETH or tokens, uh, go to L2 directly, and then start trading and, and transferring. Because we it's just not sustainable to let all of them go through deposit withdrawal mechanisms. It's very expensive on level one. But how how would that actually work? I, I want I want you to continue, but I want to just explore that for one second. Like you would buy ETH, but if you're buying ETH, you're buying ETH on L1 anyway, aren't you? Even if you're buying it on an exchange? If you buy it on an exchange, maybe you buy it from someone who already has it in ZK Sync, or maybe you buy it from the exchange, and then the exchange can batch multiple transactions together, and or maybe the exchange has already some liquidity in ZK Sync, and you just get this liquidity directly from there, and then the exchange can provide more liquidity by doing one L1 transaction from time to time, which is not going to be very expensive. It's not like doing thousands of transactions yeah. for, for thousands of users. That makes sense to me. So you don't have to go, like you don't individually have to do that exactly. lock up on L1 and okay, yes. cool. And and continue, sorry, I cut you off there. And yeah, the <laughs> third type of products who invested in ZK Sync uh, are DeFi products and they are simply waiting for, for our uh, upcoming version two where they will have smart contracts. Cool. So you're saying they're all kind of looking at it. Is there some like official ones? Is anyone already like, working on it do they have something uh sure well we we're we're building uh, integrations and and test kits and we the first uh test net application we had built was for with a uh, curve uh mm-hmm. it's live on zksync.curve.fi you can try it out it's it's been been built with zinc with the previous iteration of zinc uh, language but it just as well compiles to the new virtual machine got it like, could you actually use that though? Like, as an end user already, could like I go and do a like a stablecoin swap on that? Yeah, you can you can do this, but it's gonna happen on testnet. Okay, so you can you can swap testnet stablecoin. Yes. Okay, <laughs> got it. So it's not you can't quite do it with the real with the real thing yet. Well, you you have to wait for for our mainnet, which we're targeting for August this year. Ah, oh, very cool. It's coming up fast. Yeah. So I think one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about yet is the Matter Labs and the team that's actually building this, because I imagine over the last two and a half years, this has evolved a lot as well. So like, what is the Matter Labs team? Do you divide yourself up into like specific project teams? Like, is there a ZK Porter team and a ZK Sync team, or is it all under one umbrella? Uh, well, yes, we, we have different sub teams. Uh, the Matter Labs is organized uh, on the principles of ownership and responsibility. And we have a lot of smaller sub teams working on different things. 
Right now, we are over 20 people, and almost all of us are engineers, have engineering mm-hmm. background, and we are actively expanding the team. We are hiring uh, engineers who, uh, who are, have experience in Rust. We are hiring uh, junior engineers who are brilliant uh, and bright and ideally have experience in programming competitions in Olympiad, in informatics, ACM, ICPC uh, contests, and so on. And we are also hiring cryptographers, applied cryptographers, uh, researchers. And we we recently also started hiring non-developer positions. What what we need most is uh, someone on the communication side and uh, business development side. So if you feel interested in what we're doing and if you aligned with our values and mission please uh, talk to us and, and uh, shoot, shoot us a message cool how did you build the team like how did you originally find the co-founders and teammates this is just actually a question because the topic of onboarding folks into zk tech is something that i'm focused on right now and yeah i'm just kind of curious how how you first did it well, the, the first hires are, of course, very tough. So I've, my, I found my co-founder at the conference. So I think the, the, the greatest environment for finding co-founders is conferences and things like this, where a lot of like-minded people come together. And it's just like you, you, you have people who are interested in something and who are passionate and active enough to do something and, and to actually like have a lot of action. Man, I hope I hope we get to have conferences in person again really soon because oh, yeah. what you're saying is is so it rings true. Like, and the online versions don't quite cut it. Uh, I think it's it's not just like oh, it will be fun to travel again. It's sort of like necessary for this exact thing. <laughs> Absolutely, you 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 have uh, you're missing out on serendipity. It's it's really on being online is very different because you cannot just randomly run into people, uh, but it should not be too random. It has to have some context. So yeah, you, you need events like this. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's for co-founders. For the teammates, the early teammates we hired were exclusively from, not from the blockchain space. We were hiring okay. very smart developers. So what we're doing, we're hiring people who have very strong math back- background and developer background and who can program at very uh, like very fluently and being able to maintain very high complexity, but they mm-hmm. did not have any blockchain domain specific knowledge or any zero knowledge specific knowledge before us. We have to teach them. This sounds like it would be really intense. Like you'd have to train people, but I wonder if by doing so you also encourage new perspectives. Do you do you remember that? Like, did you notice like they might bring actually a very different, maybe a very refreshing perspective compared to what the general community is doing? So I would say that to have a new perspective, you first have to come up to, to speed with and like to, to observe all the, all the knowledge. So like if we're talking about the product ideas, then you, you actually have to understand the market really well. Okay. Right. So like it takes time to get there. If you're talking about the technology, then yes, those people who we hired were, were coming and pointing out to like directions we, which we would not originally think. So I, I think it, it has different levels. We were hiring the most scarce niche, which is like very smart technological people, because that, that's the hard part to make things execute, mm-hmm. to actually deliver. And this is why it took us longer initially to get up to speed. But now we're like really fast because we have this big team uh, who's very cohesive and very, very knowledgeable now. Nice. And I think to like 20 people is a nice, that's a nice number for a team, I feel. Yep, I agree. <laughs> I, I don't, right. I, I would not want to work in a company where I don't know everyone personally and like have relationship with everyone personally. Yeah. Cool. Well, Alex, thank you so much for coming back on the show and sharing with all of us the update to the work that Matter Labs is doing, ZK Sync, ZK Porter. Um, One thing I didn't mention throughout the episode is um, you actually recorded a video at the ZK Sessions last month all about ZK Porter. So I'll add a link to that in the show notes if anyone wants to catch that up. And you did mention you're going to have an art, like a blog post published by the time this airs. And we'll also add that into the show notes if people want to find out more. Thank you, Anna. It was really exciting as always. Cool. 
and something I want to do different for the first time ever. I want to say a big thank you to Andre, the producer of this podcast, as well as Henrik, the editor of this podcast. For the last few weeks, Andre has been with us. This has been really helpful. And Henrik has been editing this podcast for the last year. And I feel like from now on, I need to do a little shout out at the end of the episodes. So thanks again. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.